Welcome, I am your geek archaeologist, here to delve into a particular rather thorny topic about superheroes and their impact on Japanese anime. Particularly, uh, I want to talk about you know, classic Western superheroes. Superman, Batman, Fantastic Four, X-Men. Those tropes and why they are, um, or whether they have influenced anime significantly. Now we can obviously look at shows like One Punch Man, which is set in a clearly superhero, you know, Western Marvel or DC inspired universe, um, filtered through some anime tropes. Um, but yeah, that, that's not really what I'm, I'm driving at here. It's certainly part of the puzzle. But what I'm, I, I really want to get into is whether superhero stories, uh, superhero tropes, wove themselves into the fabric of anime itself. And to answer that, I think we need to kind of figure out, okay, what are the tropes of superheroes? Uh, you have very powerful main characters, uh, uh, central characters, who are powerful innately. Usually their powers are accidental, um, or their powers are, um, their powers are not intentional, I'll put it that way. Either they were born with the powers, they just kind of came along for the ride, or they were bitten by a radioactive spider, what have you. <clears throat> and they use these powers for good. One of the things that's particularly different generally in how those stories are structured, in how stories of people with power are structured, certainly is that in the West, characters with power um, use that power in ways that are interesting or helpful for them and from there end up helping society. So Tony Stark you know, makes the Iron Man suit to get out of prison, to get out of this, this, this problematic situation. Um, and he has all these skills that he's developed separately from being a superhero and then applies those to saving the world. You know, Batman is, is born with wealth but then this tragic thing happens and he uses that to help the world. Um, over in anime, generally speaking, characters are called to save the world and then given powers in which to do so. Um, so think of Magical Girls, classic example, where those girls, you know, perhaps they were chosen for certain attributes, but they did not have those magic powers until they were chosen to save the world, and then they get to do it. Um, mecha pilots, traditionally, uh, kind of stumble upon their mecha, and in a crisis which requires them to, to save other people, and they come to an appreciation of that over time. So that's certainly something that doesn't seem to have kind of seeped in to the stories of, of anime. Um, I do wonder, though, how much the idea of a character with unique abilities is a factor, where you have these characters who are, you know, let's be honest, um, um, very special, and they are the central characters, as opposed to, for example, a character who is put into a rough situation and has to become a hero, doesn't necessarily have powers, in other words. So it's that question of, of how powers work into this, where, you know, if I am a superhero, um, those powers make me a protagonist, whereas there's a lot of Japanese stories about characters who do not have powers, who do not, who are not special in any central, in any fundamental way, but who become the protagonist, become the heroes because of certain attributes of their character. Uh, certain personality quirks that cause them to decide to, you know, to um, do these certain things. So Death Note's a great example, where, you know, he's not anyone special, it's just that his reaction to getting the Death Note then creates an interesting story. Um, right? So let's see here. Um... Um, animation itself, so um, Jack Saba, that's a, that's a great point, that Miyazaki uh, saw the old Fleischer Superman cartoons, which I've been showing clips of here and there um, on the stream, 
and he found that very, very influential. And, and actually, um, uh, I know he there a lot of different uh, Western animations that, that Miyazaki kind of were in, was inspired by. Um, but that's an interesting point. That I, and, and it's certainly true that early Western animation, by early Western animation, I mean like um, Western animation of the 30s and 40s uh, made it over to Japan and were certainly influential on that first generation of Japanese animators in the kind of anime industry of the 60s and 70s and 80s, where they looked at the fluidity of that motion, the um, the sense of weight, the sense of of characters in a real world interacting that you got in those old, old Superman cartoons. Um, that's very different from the generally um, more floaty animation style where the characters are they're there on a background but clearly somebody drew that character somebody else drew the background they stopped them together um, um, and you see that in certainly in anime where there's much more of a sense in general of characters in an environment of characters interacting with each other physically um, that you don't get as much of in western animation um Um, Spin to Win, certainly, it's certainly true that superhero movies are, are, are popular in the West, but that's a recent trend. You know, that's, that's something from the past, you know, decade or so. Um, in terms of huge popularity, um, I don't think that's really influencing anime dramatically, other than with things like, you know, My Hero Academia, I think almost certainly was driven out of this surge in popularity of superheroes. And we also certainly know that, for example, um, uh, in Roni Kenshin, um, several of the characters there are modeled after characters in the X-Men uh, because Watsuki just really loved the X-Men comics and so, you know, duplicated some of that. And you see some of that X-Men influence in Kenshin of uh, being about a group of characters who are all on the outside of society, who are, to a great extent, feared by society, but who are still working to um, save society kind of in the background. So that's certainly true. Um, um, and it's certainly true, um, Spin to Win, that, um, you know, modern anime, or the modern Western animation, um, aren't really pulling much from superheroes either. Um, but the thing is, I mean, superheroes have been around for a long time, a century now. So, you know, I'm not talking about superhero movies. I'm not talking about, you know... Supergirl. I'm talking about Superman from the 30s, you know, X-Men from the 80s. Um, all those things that certainly would have made it um, over into Japan by the, the time of the anime that we all know and love. Right? So I think that's, you know, it feels like there certainly could be elements of that. Um... Um, yeah, and certainly, as Sunil says, there's parody anime out there dealing with some of these tropes and these, these elements. Um, but it's, I mean, part of the complexity, too, is that, it's kind of odd, in the West, we're not really seeing superheroes outside of Marvel and DC, right? Paramount is not making their own superhero characters. They're making characters who have kind of superheroic elements in them. Um, you know, Jack Reacher is sort of a James Bond-ish character, and James Bond is, in movies at least, kind of a superheroic character, right? Um, um, you know, and, and we're getting some, you know, over-the-top characters in certain fantasy and science fiction films, but we're not seeing you know caped superheroes running around saving the world from Titanic troubles, and I think that's really interesting. That is kind of confined to those two studios making those movies, which seems odd because it seems to me like you know if you can make Deadpool for relatively little money, why not do the same thing and kind of steal some of that thunder? And maybe that points to the fact that the superhero formula isn't something that duplicates easily, that 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 resonates out into other mediums easily. Right, that maybe superheroes are there in their own little world, and people love it, and people, you know, they become popular, but they kind of don't spread. You know, those tropes don't spread beyond it. Um, I think it's interesting that like, that um, you know you have Watchmen with 
which is this, this brilliant sort of parody of and commentary on superheroes. It comes out into a film and people watch it and they kind of, it, it's a, you know, it, it, it finds it something of an audience, but it's, it's really a, a thing about comics for comic fans. It doesn't really appeal to the mainstream. It's not meant to appeal to the mainstream. It's not meant to appeal to somebody who's only read a few comics. Um, so it can't break out in that way. Um, um, yeah, My Hero Academia, certainly. But again, I think My Hero Academia is more of a direct parody of those tropes. Um, and yeah, like you say, it's been to win. Japanese folks are always saying that Western stuff is super popular in Japan. And certainly, Western movies make way more money in Japan than Japanese movies do. Like live-action movies. Uh, you know, a Marvel movie comes out in Japan and it will make ten times as much as a Japanese live-action movie. It's just, that is the way that is for some strange reason. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. So what are some of those other tropes of superheroes? Um, sometimes it's solo, sometimes it's a team. There tends to, there tends to be teams in superheroes. Even these sort of lone characters like Batman and Superman generally end up getting hangers on and, you know, other characters doing things in their universes. So it's not just, you know, one character all the time. And, um... Certainly in, in Japanese media, it's almost never a solo character. It's almost always multiple characters all interacting, right? Um, so Neil asks, do you think making a new superhero anime slash manga with a classic traditional origin story would work without making it a parody of the superhero genre? It's a good question, and that gets down to this, this, this notion of uh, postmodernism and uh, the modern tendency towards... Uh, sarcasm and biting humor where there's this open question whether it is really possible to make something like that in any you know, medium without making it a parody like i don't know if you could tell a straight superhero origin story not unironically um i think people would just laugh at it um it's kind of interesting um i mean i think people should i think people should try but it's, it's, it's odd. I mean, you see that even in Marvel uh, movies where there's often a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the audience about how silly this all is or about how unrealistic this all is. Um, people are rolling their eyes at things happening. And that is because this is kind of silly. It is all kind of silly. And as a society, we've generally lost our ability to um, just completely sink into a world and accept it as it is. Um, I wouldn't say uncritically, but... Um, you know, if something's silly, we kind of have to acknowledge that it's silly. We kind of have to laugh at it. We can't just let it sit, let it be, which is weird. Um, I, Game Escape, I think that you're, you're absolutely right. Man of Steel tried to be completely unironic, and people hated it. They didn't hate, they didn't like it at all. The Return of Superman movie from, what, seven, eight years ago, the, the earlier reboot of Superman, I think had the same problem. Um where it just, you know, it, it was a Superman movie. Straight Superman movie, and everyone was like, eh, you know. One second. Ah, sorry. Um, and, it, I mean, certainly superhero movies just, I mean, they're a thing. And I, I'm not saying you should love superhero stories. I'm not saying superhero stories are worth watching. I'm just saying that they are certainly influential. Um... So you're right, Sunil. We have the upcoming Batman Ninja anime, and not um, not that long ago there was uh, Batman Gotham Knights. I think Batman Gotham Knights, uh, which was a series of short films, an anthology film about Batman, all done by different anime studios, and that was a fa fascinating look at Batman. I love a lot of those approaches to Batman and how he does things and why he does stuff. Um, there's some really fascinating, fascinating stuff. So here's a question. Is Super Sentai borrowing from superheroes? And Super Sentai, Super Sentai obviously goes back decades and decades, but it definitely came out after Superman in the 30s. Um, so that's a case where I would, I would argue that superheroes influenced 
um, you know, influence those live action things. And then we get things based off of Super Sentai, like Sailor Moon, which is basically Magical Girl plus Super Sentai, you know, married together. Um, so there's, there's that aspect as well of, I think, um, those aspects. And, you know, Super Sentai, including um, uh, some of the other live action things that aren't necessarily Sentai per se. It's interesting to note how Super Sentai, you, know, you have transformations, you have superpowers. Um, but again, in that case, those characters are usually chosen by an outside entity and given powers to, to, to do things. So it's kind of a, a merge of the two. I think it is kind of Japanese, sensi Japanese story sensibilities, Japanese heroic sensibilities added to a superhero concept, superhero story structure, if you will. Um... So Liquidus says that one trope they get an influence from would be the drama struggles, like analyzing Batman's moral code for how he handles crime. I'm curious, how do you, how, where would you say that influences an anime? Because I would say that there is as much, you know, analysis of that in the West as there is in Japan, but I'm not deeply familiar with that on either side of the pond. I've seen a fair amount of Batman stuff, um, but not everything. Um, right, yeah, absolutely, Super Sentai is a very different thing than a, than a, a Western superhero in the sense that, you know, it's, it's this group that is much more equal than a superhero group, right, where, yes, there's the red, you know, the red team uh, uh, member who is technically the leader, um, and you have kind of this drama back and forth, but I think, you know, in general, it, it's, it's a much more flat organization than, you know, um, the X-Men, or Justice League, or things like that. Well, yeah, they're all technically equal, but they all have these very strong... That's an interesting thing, too, actually, when you think about it. You know, the Super Friends, or the Justice League, or what have you, um, they all have their specialties, whereas in Super Sentai, the characters generally aren't that differentiated. Um, maybe they have different weapons, and, you know, different, different uh, vehicles, and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, that vehicle versus that vehicle do basically the same thing in, in an episode, even though, you know, one's a tank and one's a jeep, but there's not that much difference, you know, effectively in terms of the plot. They don't really de delve into that. So that's, I think, an interesting thing too. Um, but de yeah, certainly Super Sentai are, are, are different. Um, and so you see th those woven into, into anime. Um... So what else is interesting about, or, or unique about the superhero genre in the West? Um, so superheroes are often detective stories, often mysteries, effectively. Um, that, and, but that's a thing that kind of evolved in its own way in Japan, where this you know, science fiction medium was basically founded from the detective genre, from the mystery genre. So I think that was kind of there to begin with. Um, and then you've got, what else? Um... Uh, you've got the rogues gallery, so they're often a, a wide variety of villains. Um, I don't see that being a particular part of anime, really. Um, I don't know what MHA is, the creator. Marvel Heroic Adventures? I don't know. Um, let's see here. The wild origin stories, I think that might be something that, that worked its way in. When you look at early Japanese science fiction and fantasy stories, um, they tend to be, you know, the main character, again, stumbles into a giant robot um, or otherwise happens to be part of something. But, you know, you're not struck by lightning and given a power in anime. Um, it doesn't come out. Oh, My Hero Academia. Gotcha. Um, yeah, but I, I, like I was saying before, uh, the creator, I think My Hero Academia is a, you know, it is a parody of superheroes. It is a direct, you know, commentary on. It's not really... You know, it's like us doing a parody of anime. That's not really anime influencing the medium. It's somebody deciding to take on that 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 medium. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. And, and, and you know, getting to that point, um, I think Dragon Ball Z is an interesting case, where Goku is a is definitely more in the Superman mold than your average anime shonen protagonist. Um, and you know, it certainly seems to be based off that, and certainly. Akira Toriyama is well, very familiar with Superman, uh, you know, having had a direct Superman parody character in Dr. Slump, his earlier stuff. Um, 
And that is a case where the characters in Dragon Ball Z are quite differentiated. They're all doing basically the same thing, but they're not all, you know, um, involved in the same fights. The, you know, the power levels are, are much more varied in Dragon Ball Z than they are in your average anime series. So I would argue Dragon Ball Z is certainly influenced by those, uh, those stories more. <clears throat> so Game Escape, that's interesting. That uh, superhero stories are basically wish fulfillment narratives about coping with social violence. That's a really good point. Um, I think that that definitely hits the nail on the head. Um, and I think that's, it, it, you know, it's not just social violence in the broader sense, too. I think X-Men is very much about that idea that you know, I am um, oppressed and I wish I could zap the person oppressing me. Um, and that oppression can be, you know, what any teenager goes through, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, um, a social stigma. It can just be that I'm a geek or, you know, I like this girl or whatever. And I think you're absolutely right. The superhero stories are about that wish fulfillment of, of striking back at people who, uh, uh, who are doing the wrong thing. <clears throat> but the thing is, um, the, um, in Japan, in, 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 yeah, I would say Japan in particular, um, wish fulfillment is generally not about solving social justice issues. You know, social justice issues are things that will work the, their way out, work themselves out in society. You know, police will eventually capture the criminals. You don't really, you know, um, you don't see a strong trend in um, Japanese culture towards ending crime, right? Because um, that is a that is a, a group a group problem that the group has to solve, not the individual. Again, traditionally, um, but I think where Japanese culture took that and ran with it is the idea of growth that you, know, you can start as a 12-year-old Bruce Wayne and become Batman later on in your life if you train hard enough, right? Um... And certainly, Jack Sab Sabai, you're, you're, you're certainly right that, I mean, superhero influence, you know, superheroes came from their own, their own places, too. There, there are, you know, Zorro is definitely an early superhero, uh, or a proto-superhero. Um, and you have other examples of, of that. Uh, you know, you have the, the Mexican um, uh, luchadores as, as their own sort of superhero character, which they took in, the, in their own direction, right? Um... Uh, certainly, you know, you're right, Japanese animators, so that, that's an interesting point spin to win, of how Japanese animators, I think, certainly are anime nerds. Um, often they're animation nerds more than they're anime nerds, per se. Um, you know, they don't necessarily follow modern anime um, as it's coming out, but they're very aware of anime as an animation medium. And so, I think there's a certain kind of incestuous loop there where the same tropes tend to get recycled and there's not a lot of external influence that gets sort of thrown into there. I think it's why when you see something like, um, I forget his name, but the guy who did uh, um, um, Utna and Moaru Penguin Drum and Yurikuma Arashi, um, someone in chat will tell me who that is. Um, he tends to do stuff that does have a lot of external influences, uh, where he'll take a movie, uh, you know, uh, Yurikuma Arashi, uses a lot of, of specific visual imagery from this, I think, European 1970s film called Suspiria. And that's one of those things where when you see it, it seems very shocking because there's all these all these very strong images. Ikuhara, thank you. Because Hiko Ikuhara. I kept thinking Inoue for some reason. And um, so I think that one of the reasons that people react so strongly to that stuff is because, oh my gosh, these are external influences being imp imported onto anime. Um, which is not the case in a lot of other mediums. You know, science fiction authors and fantasy authors are much more open, much more willing to do these, you know, big, open, crazy stories um, with, you know, lots of weird influences. 100,000 Kingdoms, an interesting example, uh, where it's a fantasy story 
with anime influences. It's almost like, you know, Fushigi Yugi crossed with, you know, a, a traditional fantasy, a Western fantasy concept. And that creates a very interesting, different story. And people reacted to that and said, this is an interesting take, but they weren't shocked by it. The way people are shocked by you know, weird things. Um, right? And of course, you know, Japan had a golden bat, which was a superhero during the uh, 20s and 30s when they were, were doing all of their kamishibai, you know, paper theater on the streets kind of stuff. So certainly there are, you know, those stories. Um, and yeah, I think Tokusatsu Heroes definitely had a significant influence on anime. I think that's, that's certainly true. Um... Because you, you see those influences in anime quite a bit. Um, as I said, Magical Girls, I think, are, are certainly going there. Um, that's, uh, um, you're thinking, uh, I may be wrong, I think Shonen Bat is the character from um, um, uh, Paranoid Agent. Golden Bat is the one from uh, the, the old days. Now, Shonen Bat carries a golden bat. But I believe he's called Shonen Bat in, the, in Paranoid Agent. Whereas the original character is called Golden Bat, but I may be getting those those switched up, and I believe it was a reference back in a little slugger. Um, I believe that was a reference back to that character from the Golden Age, um, or not the Golden Age, the 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 Age of Kamishibai, the the very early days of modern Japanese storytelling. Um, and of course, you know, you have a very different culture, right? Um, Japan did not face massive crime the way America did. Japan has never had a, a, a chaotic, violent crime problem the way America does. So I think that's one of the reasons why you don't see a strong superhero influence in anime, because you know, there, there's not that social justice, that, that, that idea of social injustice to fight in your culture. Right? Um... Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, uh, and like I said, the, the um, Golden Bat character has shown up in, in diff different, different things, different, different references and, and callbacks in various anime o over the years. Um, but, yeah, it, it was really weird seeing this. I remember the first time I saw this, you know, Kamishi, but this, this guy standing next to a little poster of this character he's talking about, and it's this thing, and it's called Golden Bat. And I'm like, oh, duh! I, I know that, what? You know? Um, is that a color? Oh, that's, that's what that was. Ah, imagine that. Um, and you could also argue that, you know, that idea of street performance theater works its way into Paranoia Agent. Then your know, Paranoia Agent is about kind of memes. It's about the idea that stories spread and influence people. And that's kind of what Kamishibai was doing. It was people, you know, a guy, you know, riding a bicycle on, uh, up to a group of kids telling a story. And then they would all tell that story to each other and talk about that story. That became part of their culture just by one guy telling a story. Um, yeah, little slugger. Um, so, yeah, Paranoia Agent is a very interesting thing, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point. So I think we've kind of come full circle on this very effectively, where I, I think superheroes are, excuse me, superheroes were solving a problem for American culture that didn't need to be solved in Japanese culture as strongly. And so the tropes got, you know, worked in a little bit with things like, again, you know, um, you know, Goku being inspired by Superman and other characters being, you know, other stories kind of being inspired by that and Tokusatsu bringing elements of superhero into, the, into them. But it's not kind of going there. Um, in today's day and age, I would definitely, in any day and age, I'd prefer the 80s Superman. Um, because the 80s Superman isn't flawless, right? Um, he's unsure of himself. So, well, he, he doesn't always know if what he's doing will work. Um, you know, but he knows, he has a strong sense of what should be done and what he needs to do next. And so I find that interesting, as long as it's handled in a way that doesn't make him seem omnipotent and... Um, um, a deus ex machina, right? Um, I think it's really interesting when a character is 
has these strong opinions and has these these strong things and is faced with difficult choices around that. I've always found Batman a more interesting character than Superman because Batman is frequently faced with problems that cannot be solved by punching somebody into orbit, right? Um, cannot be solved, maybe Superman can solve problems. Uh, and so Batman has to face different ways of dealing with things, right? Um... Yes, yeah, well, it's been, I, I don't know which one superheroes either, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but I, here's the problem with, to me, with characters who are, mm, um, to me, certain types of characters are meant to be used in certain ways, right? Um... In The Lord of the Rings, I would not have wanted Frodo and Sam to be completely sure and convinced that they would go to the fires of Mount Doom and, you know, throw the ring into, into, the fire, into, into Mount Doom and everything would be okay and they'd come back. You know, I wanted them to be troubled, uncertain characters who frequently um, struggled with the question of whether they were actually going to succeed. Um, that works for that kind of a story. But for a superhero story, um, I want characters who are, again, not flawless, but characters who are firm of opinion and purpose. Because it's much more interesting to me when you can b bounce those characters off each other. When you can have Green Arrow and Green Lantern have a conversation like, um, people, the law should be upheld. People should follow the law what if the law is wrong, right? Those are two, it's, it's a law versus chaos questions. Um, you know, you've got lawful good and chaotic good, very much discussing things like that. And I think that's interesting. Roni Kenshin is my favorite shonen story because the characters are not all powerful, um, but they have very strong beliefs, very strong senses of what they should be doing. What, and not necessarily what other people should be doing, but what how, how they believe, in general, people should behave. and But th those opinions differ, where they have different takes on that. And I think that is what, one of the strengths of that story, where I very much look up to Kenshin, and I look up to Sano in his own way. And I look up to Megumi in her own way. And I look up to, you know, all these different characters in all these different ways, because they have... Um, uh, because while they are firm in their beliefs, those beliefs are interesting to, to look at and, and, and to analyze, right? Um, from a storytelling perspective, a character like Batman is more, is a little more interesting because you can do, you can more easily do more interesting stuff with Batman, right? Uh, it is easier to tell a complex moral story with Batman than with Superman. Um, whereas with Superman, there's only so much you can do with that character. As Stan Lee liked to joke, they had to invent kryptonite to create interesting stories for Superman. Because as it is, he's kind of, you know, um, he's limited in his stories. Not a bad character, but just there's only so much you can do with that archetype. Um... Jack Sabat asks, are, is Tokusatsu still as popular as it was in the 60s to 80s? That's a good question. I don't know how popular they were in the 60s to 80s um, compared to today. I would argue they are somewhat less popular, but still very popular. I mean, when I went to Japan, there was still plenty of Tokusatsu stuff you know, being advertised in various areas um, and advertised to kids and, you know, ads on TV, things like that. So I think that's definitely, you know, it's still a big thing. Uh, maybe not the massive cultural force. And I think that's just, you know, fragmentation of the market where there's not that many people watching any one thing anymore to begin with. All right, thank you all very much for this discussion. As always, it was very interesting, very helpful. And um, we will see how that goes. So um, we will see how this, that goes next week when we uh, um, uh, tackle a completely different topic. So anyway, um, that will do it for uh, that. I hope to see you guys for the next great debate.